Welcome, welcome, everybody. So I hope that you are doing well this morning like I am. Um, and just so you know, in case you were here last week, um, we didn't plan for the lights to go out. It just happened. So uh, if you were here for the 11 o'clock last week, that uh, I got about 10 minutes into my talk. In case you weren't here, you're like, really? This happened? Yes, it really happened. About 10 minutes into my talk, everything went out. Power went out. Uh, my, my microphone went out. All the space, everything all over campus went out. That was not by design. But one thing I thought was really cool through that process is, and I thought about this this week, I thought even in the midst of all of that happening and the lights going out, we never stopped one time from being the church. Not one time. We never stopped from doing the very things that we're supposed to do as a church. We never stopped in the the very moment of all of that and everybody wondering like, okay, what's going to happen next? I was on that list. I had no idea what's about to happen next. But nowhere in the midst of all that did we stop doing what we're commanded to do in the New Testament, which I rejoice in that. This series... I think is, is, and believe is so well connected to what we've just gone through because the last series, it was talking about emotional health and now we're gonna start talking about this is us, that we are DBC and DBC are we, all of us. I know it's not grammatically correct, but I don't care, right? I'm gonna say it over and over and over. That we are DBC and DBC are we. It's all of us, the collective of people, but I think it's so cool because in the last series, we talked about all of the, uh, some relational struggles that we've had, and we've talked about how our upbringing has shaped, to, uh, shaped us to be the people that we are, and now we get to talk about how we can reshape, our, how we can be reshaped in the way that Jesus wants us to be shaped within community. So this series is, uh, is going to talk about belong, become, beyond, begin. Today is the idea of belonging, and the big idea for today is this, that we can feel like we belong even without believing everything. That us as a church, we, we want to be a place to where people can feel like they belong even before they believe everything that we believe. Because here's one thing I know to be true. We don't all even believe the exact same things, do we? Like, if, as long as we get the core things right, we're solid. But we don't need to believe every single thing. We're not trying to punch out widgets that everybody looks alike. You've had a story. Your life is is it's been different than mine and the other people in this room and the people who are in the 915 your life has been different but yet it we're all to be part of a community of faith and the community of faith is called the church and it starts with a place of belonging so this is us we are dbc and dbc are we years ago i told uh, you the story about uh, some individuals who've, who've played an instrumental part in in marla Marla and in my life, our, our lives, and really shaped my faith story. And Neil and Sally Abners were people who allowed me to have a place where I felt like I could belong before I even believed that really the, any of the core essentials about Jesus. We had been asked to go to church by some friends of ours, and they just invited us in. And I think maybe what the selling point is, they actually invited us to like a nice steak dinner. So there you go. If you want to win somebody to Jesus, start with a nice steak dinner and pay for it. Um, or if you want to win your pastor over, it works there too. Just either way, um, I like steak. So, but it was great. So just being with them, they invited us into their lives. And, and I know, and I totally believe that there's, there's no way that they would have known that that little bit of influence in that short span of time would be so significant in my life. Because after they gave me a place to belong, even before I believed really much of anything about Jesus, they gave me a place to where I started to put some things together. They allowed me a space and in a class, and they invited us to dinner, and they invited us just to be real with us. That they, they met us right where we were, and yet in the midst of that, just a very short time later, um, I would commit my life to Jesus in that very church but yet it started with a place of belonging before I believed. So I have two questions that I want us to think about as we go into this talk. When I say the word church, what do you think of? When I say the word church, what do you think of? What's, the, what's a, a phrase, what's, a, what's the atmosphere of that room that you think of? Family, what's the what's the condition of that room? You see, for me, early on in life, I had some church experiences. They were sporadic and they were they were interesting, to say the least. But none of those like just pointed me right to Jesus in those moments. And yet 
if you would have said what church is before I gave my life to Jesus, I would have said the church may be judgmental, confusing, stale, cold, separate. Maybe I would have identified church as being, oh, that's the place that I go to see that person who's on stage. So when I say the word church, what do you think of? Maybe for you, it's wooden pews. I also think about that, wooden pews, and going to get in the pews and shanking my knees on those pews. I do, I think about that. Maybe you think about a certain person. Maybe it was a person who, who passed judgment, that there was not a lot of love and grace in their message. It was just a lot of truth, and it was harsh in delivery. Maybe that's what you think of. So when I say the word church, what do you think of? I want us in this series to reform Whatever that image is, if it's unhealthy, I want it to be reformed into what the Bible says it should be. Second question is this, what is the church supposed to be like? Because we all come into church, we come into these gatherings with, with some ideas as to what church is supposed to be like. Some of us, we think, well, church is just about family. And I don't know who said that, but there's an element of family, and I talk about this as family, but that's not the sole purpose of church. We can operate as family and yet keep everybody else at arm's length. So it, it has to feel like family, but it also has to feel differently that we're welcoming other people in. So what is a church supposed to be like? Does it mean that we, we just gather together on Sunday mornings to hear some really cool music and, and we sing and, and we declare all these truths and you listen to some great truths and then we live our lives Monday through Saturday? What is, what is a church supposed to be like? So we're going to dig deeply into these. I have... Some misconceptions that are right here in our, in, in our culture. These all, we could disagree on these, but I certainly see them as a pastor and just somebody who's, who's trying to be aware of the culture because of what I do and the relationships that I have. So I, I believe that some folks believe these things about churches today. They either believe that the church is irrelevant, for one. I believe there's... That it's just irrelevant. I mean, after all, let's think about this logically. Some people believe that church is irrelevant because you can get better messages on YouTube, world-class messages on YouTube. You can hear world-class worship leaders on Spotify and Pandora and on YouTube. I mean, it's a one-stop shop. So that, that's formed a mindset of, I just don't need People, church is irrelevant because now we have technology to meet all these needs. But you know what technology doesn't meet? The need for connection. The need for connection. It doesn't meet that need. And the church is a matter of being connected. So some people believe that it's irrelevant. The second thing on the list is this. Some people or some folks believe that these things about churches today, and we have to really think about this next one. Some people believe that, that Republicans are the real church. And I'm not trying to be funny. There's a mindset that the Republicans are the real church, meaning how in the world could somebody be a Democrat and be a Christian? I mean, after all, the Bible says. Isn't that the next, isn't that the next phrase? After all, the Bible says. But if you lean heavily into the life of Jesus, you see that maybe Jesus wasn't trying to form a group of people who were red-blooded Republican Americans. Jesus was trying to do something much bigger. So there's this misconception that the Republicans are the real church. So part of that, let me flip it around. So part of that, I just want you to think about this rationally. Even before you post something on, on social media, before you have that conversation about this politi political figure that you disagree with, and whether you're Republican or Democrat, wherever you are, I just want you to think about this. I want you to think about the influence that you're giving away by first giving away your political position. I want you to think about the influence you're giving away by giving away your first, your, your political party, your political affiliation. Because if that's your lead in, people are already believe, they're starting to believe that Republicans are the real church. So if Republicans are the real church, the mindset that follows that is this. I have to agree with you politically before I can believe in Jesus spiritually. Think how twisted that is. That's what's happening in our culture. Our political persuasion has become a stumbling block from people coming to Jesus 
Another thing on my list is the idea of being a country club. This one is not going to be new. Some of you have heard this phrase, and, and maybe you've even thought, well, I left that church because it was, it was like a country club. It was exclusive because I didn't fit into this party. I didn't, or this, this political socioeconomic class, or maybe I was a different race, or maybe they weren't a different race, and it was just all kinds of confusion, all these other things that were going on. So it started to feel um, more like you are only going to be let in if you look like everybody else, and they weren't allowing you to be you, the country club. Another one that I see is this. That's the place for my kids to learn how to be good. That's the place for my kids to learn how to be good. That's the place for my kids to learn to be good. My grandpa, in my office, I've got this picture of my grandpa, and I I didn't find this picture. um, I didn't get this picture until fairly recently, and my grandfather's passed away, but my grandmother gave me this picture. It's a, just this great picture of, of my grandpa. And my grandpa, it's, old, it's a super old picture, but he was the chief of police and in, in this little town, the city of Wit. And back then, it was like the big happening city that had 2,000 people. And now it's like probably less than 1,000. The city's just kind of collapsed. Urban, you know, people are moving away and finding jobs elsewhere. So the city's just collapsing, unfortunately. But my grandpa, and it's heyday, my grandpa was the chief of police. And I've got the picture on my desk to prove it. And he was just this big, he was 6'2", 6'3". He was this big opposing figure. Nobody, I mean, word got around in, in, the, in the city of where you don't mess with my grandpa. Like he was the chief of police and he didn't, he wasn't unnecessarily harsh, but if it was necessary for him to be harsh as a police officer, he would go there very, very quickly. So he demanded respect to the people. And that picture so eloquently shows it because he's standing there looking like John Wayne, looks like a cowboy. He's got a cowboy hat on. Like he doesn't have a six shooter, but like you would swear that in the picture that, that he should. Like it's that kind of thing. But in that, I heard a conversation, or excuse me, in a conversation I heard not too long ago, somebody was talking about when my grandpa was the chief of police, and they said, when my grandpa came around, it's like people just knew not to mess around. Like he was just, he was the chief of police. And I thought to myself, I wonder if when parents simply come to church to make their kids good, I wonder if they're not making the church to be the moral police. I wonder if those in those times where, where, the, where the adults, they, go, they come into church and they're like, you know what, I don't really need church. I've, I, I'm saved. I've got everything figured out. I'm good. I wonder if they just, kick their, they just bring their kids into church and they just they kind of kick them in the doors and get them in there and treating the church as if they're the moral police. Again, I want you to think about this just logically. If you treat the church as, as if it's the place where your kids have to go to be good, you're treating the church as if they're the moral police and that I'm the chief of police. That they need to come in the room because pastor's going to get them all figured out. And what burdens me about this is this, this phrase hasn't been generated by conversations I've had outside of these walls. What burdens me is this phrase came to mind and this came from my mind because of conversations I've had within these walls. So it isn't that, that the world has this misconception about church. It's that church people have a misconception about church. This is the place where I bring my kids so they can learn to be good. Again, I, I want you to think through this logically. How many teenagers just have been curious enough to say, you know what, I want to take a tour of the police station? They're like, just curious. Be like, I just want to go back. I want to see what's going on behind the glass. Can I see the jail? Can I see your desk? Let's sit, let's sit and talk about this. If we treat the church like we're the moral police, I wonder if in those moments you're not just going to lead your kids farther away from church because there's going to be a moment in time where you no longer can force them to come to church. And if they've been the moral police the whole time, what makes you think for a second that as soon as they can decide to come to church that they will then decide not to go to church because after all, Who really likes the moral police idea anyway? Again, think about it differently. Anybody who has any level of social media. I mean, aren't you just sick of seeing people in the name of Christ to try and be the moral police for the rest of the world? 
Like, I'm sick of that. We're, we're to be our brother's keeper, sister's keeper within the family of God. But if you're not part of the family of God, they're not accountable to us. And our morality cannot be imparted upon them. They have to have a space to where they can feel like they belong even before they believe. We have to watch what we lead in with. We have to really, really watch it. Another misconception is this, that men make all the decisions and women do all the work. That's a common misconception when it comes to church. It's like men make all the decisions and women do all the work. I don't believe that's true of our church. I strive for it not to be true. There are ladies part of the the decision-making processes about things around here. And also, I don't believe it's true of our church because there's a lot of men who serve in all levels of ministry here. But that is a misconception about church today. And lastly, this one leads right into the bottom line, is you have to believe before you can belong. That misconception is already in people's minds. People already believe this in their heart that you have to believe everything spiritually before you can belong there physically. So the bottom line for this in what we're going to see in the life of Peter, we're, not going to, we're going to dig into the Scriptures, but we're not going to get down to the nitty-gritty of things because we don't need to. We can just literally just take an overview of it and see exactly what the Scriptures have. But the bottom line is this. The church is a community where you can feel like you belong even before you believe. The church is to be the most inviting place on the planet, places on the planet, to where somebody can feel like they belong even before they believe. That's our goal. Certainly when it comes to this idea of belonging. I want to share a scripture from Matthew 4, and then eventually we're going to skip ahead in, uh, in the storyline of Peter, but I want to give you just briefly, I want to give you just a little bit of a, of a background on Peter and some things that become interesting and then yet uh, help us to understand best what God is, is eventually going to say in Matthew 16 when he says some very definitive things about Peter's life. Peter was a simple man. He was uh, a fisherman, and he was the type of person who maybe at first he was kind of, uh, he would appear as kind of rough and, and, and maybe you like want to hide the women and children from him. He was just, you just didn't know what he was going to say. You just didn't know what he was going to do. And certainly if you were to pick the top 12 uh, people who you would pick to be on your team and then carry the message of the church, certainly you, you and I probably wouldn't pick Peter, but Jesus did. And he picks Peter and Peter was certainly, he was somebody like, I just don't know if I want him on the team like, he might be a liability, but I want to keep him close. So I'm not going to put him, put him on the field. Instead, I'm going to make him the water boy, very much like the Bobby Boucher version of, like, you know, church leadership. Like, I want him close, but I don't, I don't want him to be, like, all the way into all that. So yet, Peter is yet invited in. And this is actually what the Scriptures say about when he was first invited in Matthew 4. It says, from Jesus' invitation, this was the same invitation given to the first four disciples, that word Disciple also means learner, also could be interpreted as apprentice. This is going to be important in just a moment. This is the invitation of Jesus. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. There's nothing all that complicated about this. There's nothing oh so spiritual about this other than the fact that they were fishermen. Peter was a fisherman, and Jesus gives them an invitation to belong. He gives them an invitation to then become his disciples, which is countercultural in their day because if you were a top-line rabbi, you people would try to become disciples, and then the rabbi would go through dependent upon if you met the criteria and then hand-select you and let you in as being part of his crew, not the way Jesus works. Instead, Jesus looked out for the person. Very simply, the type of person Jesus uses is the person who's willing to be used by Jesus. I'll say it again. Some of you missed it. The person that Jesus uses is the person who's willing to be used by Jesus. So he picks Peter. He picks Peter not because he has this amazing skill set. He's not getting fishing advice. 
It's not because, wow, you're, just, you're connected to this family line. And, and Jesus said, no thought, I don't believe that Jesus thought, well, you're connected to this family line. And it's like a very religious family line. And if I can kind of tap into that, people believe that, that the gospel is true and they're going to believe all these things about me. I don't believe that at all. Instead, he picks Peter because the person that Jesus uses is the person who's willing to be used by Jesus. And Jesus chose his first 12 not because of their great attributes, but because they're willing to be used. It's as simple as that. This was an invitation to belong with Jesus. That's all this was. There's no profession of faith here. It's saying, hey, you were a fisherman. That's what you were doing. Now I want you to drop your nets and instead I'm going to teach you how to be fishers of men. They didn't fully understand what this even meant. Trust me. But now there's an invitation here. This was your identity. Now your identity is going to be brought into something that's even more powerful. Eventually, Peter's going to find out in Matthew 16 that his life is going to be so significant, not because of any accolades, not because of achievements, not because of his family line, simply because he was willing to be used by God and people that are willing to be used by God will be used by God to do extraordinary things. Let's fast forward. Now, I want to give you just a little bit here, a backdrop. This will help you to understand the rest of this series, really the rest of not just the series, but where we're going even next year and in the years to come. Discipleship under Jesus, it goes something like this. Disciple or learner. That's the passage we just read. Believer, Matthew 16. That's where we're going to be, 13 through 20. And then worker, this, in Luke 10, this was the sending out of the, the 70 or 72. I preached this a couple months ago, remember? The sending out of the 70 or 72, looking for a person of peace, and, and that whole thing going in to, to share the good news. The next one is servant. The main passage here you can look at later. This is Jesus is not just teaching his disciples how to be servants, but he's showing them how to be servants by washing their feet. He just washes their feet. It's just an incredible act of humility and servanthood. But he also says, you need to go out and wash other people's feet too. You need to be willing to serve. And last, on this list, and this is just my list. There there could be so many more things added here, but just for um, kind of some handholds to help us to understand this journey. The last one I put on the list is leader. And if you zone in specifically into Acts, and really Acts 4, you would see that the The leadership of the church, this is after the resurrection and after the ascension and after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit had been released, all these amazing, miraculous things happened. And now the church is starting to take form. And then Peter and John are brought before uh, the council and they're brought before the people and and the council's looking at them and they're, they're so confused. They're like, I just don't understand why these people just will not stop talking about Jesus. And, uh, and what did they say about Peter and John specifically? They said that they were unschooled and ordinary men, but they had been with whom? Jesus. They had been with Jesus. So the very core of their leadership wasn't their abilities because their abilities were lined out ahead of time. They were ordinary. I don't know about you, but I feel very ordinary. I praise God that I feel ordinary. I praise God that, I, that I'm not extraordinary because I would, I would more think I would think more highly of myself than I ought to. I understand who Jesus is making me to be, and I understand my identities in him, but I also understand where I began. And I also understand this, without the work of God in my life, I know where I could drift. So what was said of them is really what I want to be said about us, that we're just ordinary people. And they were unschooled, but they had been with Jesus. What if, what if, think about this church, think. What if all people would say about you is, that you had been with Jesus. That they didn't lead in with, you know what, they were really successful. They had all these followers. They got all these likes on their pictures. They had all this money in the bank. They had all this influence. But what if the very thing that people said about you was they had an authentic walk with Jesus? That's what's being said about Peter. You see this in the the storyline of the disciples. If you have a study Bible, I'm not going to have you flip there because I'm just going to give you a reference point. But I have a life application study Bible. And what is so, so interesting about 
the words that you see, disciple, believer, worker, servant, leader, if you actually look in a, a life application study Bible, it gives a timeline, a chronological timeline about, about what basically the, the life and events, or excuse me, the events of Jesus' life. And these all are chronological. All of these are chronological. So if you go through and look at it, at what Jesus is doing in these people's lives, it's, it's disciple, be a learner, be an apprentice, follow me. A believer, the main, our main passage, a worker. You see all of this being played out, and then learning how to, to serve and then pursue leadership. And there too, I realize you could look at this and some of us, we think, I don't, so you're saying I need to, like, I need to maybe become a full disciple before I can become a believer? Don't think of it like that. At the same time, you can be growing in these five different silos, if you will. You, you can be growing, you should be always growing as a disciple, always growing as a believer, always growing as a worker, always growing as a servant, and then always growing as a leader. We should be growing in all of these things. You don't need to wait until one silo is full before you start filling the other. Because if that's the case, as soon as, you, as soon as you stop filling this silo and you start working on this one, guess what's going to happen to the other silo? It's going to start going down. Sound effects were included, free of charge. Like that's what's going to happen. So we're growing in these five areas at the same time. This should be the pursuit of every follower of Jesus. And if somebody's not a follower of Jesus, they should feel like they have a place to belong even before they even believe. Our main passage is Matthew 16. I don't need to give you much of the context because we're actually going to see it. But Matthew 16, starting in verse 13 through 20, is going to show the progression. And I led in with this a little bit. I gave a little bit of, a, of it away that Peter was at, or he was given the opportunity. Jesus initiated this apprenticeship, this following, this discipleship with Jesus, of which would take three years. That Jesus did that even before he believed. And I can prove it to you because it's in this passage. He didn't believe all the things about Jesus yet. Let's look at verse 13, chapter 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or maybe like the catch-all phrase, or one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ. Could be translated Messiah or the anointed one, the expected one from the Old Testament, of which there are hundreds of prophecies about. Peter says, You are the Christ. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I will tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you, you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Jesus did not want all this information about him being the Christ or him being the Messiah to get out yet because in God's perfect timing, that, new, that news would be revealed to the religious leaders. That news eventually would then be released to the, the people in the Roman Empire controlling that area, and this would ultimately bring about Jesus' death sentence, but it wasn't time for that yet. Instead, Jesus is is still building into his disciples. Verse 13, backing up, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, this region is, is, is a place you can still go to today. So somebody who's skeptical of the Bible, I just don't, don't even know if the Bible's true, the Bible's make-believe, the church is make-believe, it's all a fairy tale. I can blow that up with this this solid historical and, and geographical fact, you can go to this very place today. This place existed well before the days of Jesus. As a matter of fact, this place had a historical significance all the way back to the original tribes of Israel, this same place. It's a place you can go to today. This place is still believed to be the headwaters of the Jordan River. It's, there are caves all around this area, and there's a, 
in just an area where there's really, really, really deep spring and a water a waterfall just f- gushing out of it, just continually gushing out of it. I saw a picture of it. It's beautiful. You could still go to this place today. Well, I don't know why Jesus chose this particular place. People speculate, but I just tell you that you can go there even today. Some things are telling about this passage in verse 15 when Jesus asked the question, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He then is professing belief in Jesus. This this was his continual walk of being a disciple and an apprentice and following Jesus for all those years. And now, now you see he's forming a belief. You are the son of the living God. Notice what Jesus says next in verse 17. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but but by my father in heaven. He's like this. You didn't just come to this conclusion all by yourself. The Father revealed this to you. Blessed are you, Simon Peter, because the Father has just spoken to you and just revealed this great truth to you. He continues in the next verse, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. There's some playfulness in Jesus, even when he says this, because he says you are Peter, and Peter, the name Peter means rock. So he's saying, and on this rock... Verse 18, that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Isn't it amazing to think that the gates of hell are not going to prevail over the church? There's always going to be a remnant of the church, whether, whether it's here on earth or yet we are existing in heaven, the church will always exist. To me, that's amazing. I want you to think through, if you're, if you're politically charged, I want to get back into that just for a second. If you're very politically charged, I want you to think about it in regards to this. No empire in the existence of the world has lasted forever. Don't think for a second that the United States of America is going to last forever. We have no evidence to think that that's true. Every empire eventually collapses. But yet, what did Jesus say to Peter and what is being said to us? And I I will tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. That the church is going to be the most longest lasting assembly in the existence of mankind. And nothing is going to stop it. Everything else will cease, but the church will never cease. It will never stop. Again, verse 18 says, and I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. What he's telling Peter is, you are going to be the leader of this movement. You, you ultimately, you're not going to be in charge of the whole thing, but you're going to be the leader. There's going to be a time where you're going to be the leader. And in this time, Peter, I want you to know that your work is going to be very significant. You started out as a fisherman, but your life is so much more powerful. Your story, your story of your own redemption and is going to lead to the redemption of others. And it is going to begin with you being the leader of this, this assembly, this movement of God. Go to the next verse, verse 19. And he says this, and I, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't mean that Peter gets to decide who's saved and who's not saved. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying that, that in these, these early times, the message of the gospel is going to flow from your lips. And you're going to have such influence. And this influence is people are going to be hearing the gospel for the first time. They're going to be hearing about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is going to be impacting their lives and it's going to start with your leadership. 
You see, all of this began with Jesus' initiation and Jesus' work in Peter's life. It wasn't that Peter had achieved so much that it was a no-brainer that Jesus had to go pick him because he was already successful. It wasn't that he achieved some great spiritual high mark that Jesus was like, well, he's the spiritual elite one, so he's going to be the leader. Well, who's, who's the second one? Okay, well, Andrew, come on over. I know it's your brother. You're going to have issues. You'll work it out. All right, get behind. James, John, ah, you got sons of thunder. You're going to have some issues too, but get in line. Like Jesus chose those people, and he used those people because he was doing a work in those men. And shortly after that, he would start doing a work in ladies in much the same way. But that's how it began. It wasn't that they had done a bunch of great things. This idea of the kingdom of heaven, I'll I'll give you this summary phrase, if you will, for the kingdom of heaven. It's this. Jesus, the king of kings, has gathered saved people around total loving allegiance to his kingly rule. And that Jesus has welcomed them into his kingdom family and Jesus has included them into his kingdom expanding mission. This is what we're to be about as a church. That we're all gathered, the church is saved people, and we're all gathered under the kingly rule of Jesus. That means that I'm not in charge, you're not in charge, Jesus is ultimately in charge. We look at his word to see what it is that we're supposed to do, when we're supposed to do it, trusting in the discernment of the Holy Spirit. When he says move, we, we move. When he says stop, we stop. When he says speak, we speak. When he says hear, we hear. And that's what we do as we're following the kingly rule of Jesus, adhering to his word by the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the love of the Father. The second thing is this, welcomed into his kingdom family. That we're all about the kingdom as family. That we all have a common goal. That we're all pursuing Christ-likeness together. We're all trying to become what Jesus said that we should become. We're all trying to grow in our discipleship of Jesus. And and the way that we're working for Jesus. And the way that we're serving for Jesus. And the way that we're leading people. And lastly, into his kingdom-expanding mission. Which means that our Sunday morning gatherings aren't the be, the be all end all of what we do. Instead, our Sunday morning gatherings are a place where somebody can come in and they can feel like they belong even before they believe everything that we believe. And yet, this is just one small expression of the Christian faith. The rest of our, of our Christian faith is to be expressed Monday through Saturday. And the way that we live out the life that Jesus has told us to live out. I'll say it another way. The church that Jesus died for and saved is supposed to be a community of healing, belonging, and encouragement as we gather together one anothering one another. A community of healing. I would add to that a community of hope. A place of belonging. A place where we can get encouraged. I want to give you two different sections of statements. The first one is something that's going to help us to understand all of this whole series, and then I want to break down the belonging part even, even further. So the first statement is this, the church is made up of ordinary people who get to do extraordinary things with God. Definitely see that in the disciples' lives. Maybe you've witnessed that in your own life. Second thing, your upbringing has shaped who you are, and you needed a community a faith to shape all that God wants you to be. You cannot grow spiritually alone. You cannot grow spiritually if your, your bits of spiritual growth are by listening to a worship song on Spotify or Pandora or YouTube or by listening to a, a message on YouTube. That is only a fraction of what we're supposed to do to become more like Jesus. You need a community of faith to shape all that God wants you to be because your upbringing has shaped you in a certain way. And we need each other to chip away the parts that don't look like Jesus so we can lift up the parts that do. Amen? We all learn the Christian life from how our congregation shapes us. Which is why it's important that you know who the leaders are in the church. Which is why that it's, it's important that there's accountability within the leadership of every church. 
which is why the leadership needs to be close to those that are leading so they don't have this superiority complex that we're so far removed from, quote unquote, the people, that we are of the people. We're not, there's no leader that's higher than the people, that we're with the people. And it's important that you know that because the Christian life, your Christian life is going to be shaped by the congregation, by those within the congregation. And it's supposed to. The next statement is this. A local church really does shape what you think the Christian life is all about. If, if we make this place to be a bunch of rules, you're going to think that I have to follow the rules to love Jesus. If this, if this place becomes a country club, if all the somebody does who stands on the stage to talk about political things, then, then eventually people are going to believe that, that the real church is just made up of a bunch of Republicans or whatever political persuasion that gets promoted. It's so important that we get this right because a local church really does shape what we think the Christian life is all about, which is why we have been just campaigning for the last two years for us to dig into the elements of spiritual formation, for you to pray more, not just to pray, not just because I want to add a rule to you, because I know that through prayer and through Bible study, through confession of your sins, through meditation, through fasting, through celebration, through, through the elements of the Lord's Supper, that these things bring you closer to Jesus. And as a congregation, we're trying to bring one another to where we look more like Jesus. If we're not doing those things, we're actually failing in what we're supposed to do. People feel like they belong when these things happen. People feel like they belong when they're invited into our lives and into our gatherings. People feel like they belong when they're invited into our lives and our gatherings. That is absolutely what happened with Peter. Peter, he, he was following after Jesus. He didn't have the answers. All, I'm certain he had just a ton of questions, but yet Jesus invited him into this three-year discipleship. Not because Peter had done anything, but eventually Jesus knew that Peter would eventually have, he would profess that Jesus is the Christ. And that eventually that, that on this rock that the church would be formed, that he would be the first leader in there. Second thing, people feel like they belong when we meet others where they are, which is what Jesus did. Four simple fishermen. When we meet others where they are, we will not create unnecessarily, unnecessary hurdles for people to cross before they could come to Jesus. One of the reasons why the church looks at the way that it does, one of the reasons why I communicate the way that I do, one of the reasons why that our kids' ministry functions in the way that it does, one of the reasons why we sing the songs that we sing and the way that we do them is because we don't want to create any hurdles for those who are far from God. We don't want to create any hurdles. We want to meet others where they are and give them a space where they can feel like they belong even before they believe what we believe. Third thing is this, we want to praise God for the work that he's doing in their lives. So when people feel like they belong, when they praise God for the work that's being done in their lives. So now, Christians, we should be close enough to one another where we can celebrate what God is doing in each one of our lives. That we gather in community groups and we gather in our Bible studies, we gather in our, our rise small groups and we can celebrate the work of God in our lives. That, that somebody, at least one person, I think it needs to be several people, but somebody within the community of faith, they know us and they can see when we're growing spiritually because here's what I know about myself. I can't always even see when I'm growing spiritually. I don't know it until 10 years later. And I'll say, wow, I just don't think the same way. But I need people in my life. You need people who are in your life who are that close to you to point out to you, say, you know what? You are growing spiritually. Because if we're not affirmed, and if we're not blessed by other people to say, wow, I see this growth in you. In essence, if, if people don't remind us that, you know what, we are taking spiritual ground in Jesus' name, we will be convinced that devil is winning. And we too could lose hope. The last thing is this. People feel like they belong when they're welcomed and encouraged to take steps toward spiritual growth. We're going to meet people where they are spiritually. We're going to allow them to wrestle with some things spiritually. 
but we're not just going to allow their brokenness to define the rest of their life. We're not just going to to celebrate brokenness. We're not. We're going to celebrate redemption. We're going to allow people to bring in that brokenness within the, within the community. I mean, Peter was all sorts of broken. You, if you look at the Gospels, you see his life is all sorts of broken all through this whole process, even up to right before Jesus died. And yet Jesus worked with him and he listened to him and he reprimanded him when he needed to and he loved him and he loved him and he loved him. You see, people that feel like they can belong when they're welcome and encouraged to take steps of spirit for, into their spiritual growth. So sure, we want people to, to know that they can come in this place and they can, you know what, you can come in and bring all of your baggage, but we as a community of faith are going to help you to be untethered from that baggage. That's what we're going to do. Scripture tells us in Isaiah 53, 6, that all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one has gone their own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, we're just going to be wonders through life. We're not going to have spiritual direction in our life. The, those that we're trying to, to share the love of Jesus that are far from God, they're not going to know the way. Like what Karen said about how Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And Jesus said that in John 14, 6, and no one comes to the Father but through me. You see, nobody's going to know the way. Everybody's going to be wandering around spiritually because all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one has gone their own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Everybody's just going to be wandering through life. But how awesome would it be if we continue to create environments like this where we allow people to feel like they can belong even before they believe? So that when Jesus gets a hold of them, that they realize that they don't have to wonder anymore. That this spiritual journey that they've been on has led them to this moment in time. And ultimately to Jesus. See, I believe we're, being, we're becoming this. But I also believe that we need to be reminded that this is who we need to continue to strive to be. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, without the virgin birth, without your sinless life, without your atoning sacrifice on the cross, without your resurrection, and without your ascension, none of this would be possible. Lord Jesus, you have inspired millions. You've equipped millions. You've invited millions to follow. You've invited millions to believe. And Lord Jesus, help us to get it right in our day. Help us to understand that all of us at one point needed a space where we could feel like we belonged even before we believed. Help us, Lord Jesus, to do what you did for Peter and the rest of them. A place just to, to follow even before belief. And God, I pray that you would use us as a mighty army. That we... God, out of obedience to you and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would shake the foundation of hell. By the power that's invested in us through your spirit, God, I pray that, that, that you would use us to shake our community, to shake it up spiritually, to shake those who, who are in a state of unbelief to where they lean in. To shake people who maybe are, are believing and yet they, they're, they're living in doubt and not that belief, God, that they would be reined in into that belief. Those that are, who are believing and pursuing God, that they would just continue to be spurred on to more hope and belief and service and leadership. I thank you, Jesus, for the atoning work of the cross 
that when you died on the cross, you allowed all of us who would believe to have an opportunity to walk in the newness of life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.